Hey there, it is good to be with you tonight. I hope you're all doing well and that you're having a good week so far. And I hope to see you this coming Sunday, either at 9 a.m. or at 10.30 a.m. I know it's not perfect, it's not ideal to have two services like this, but we do what we can with the space that we have. If anybody has a large barn or a large pavilion that they'd like to donate to the congregation, let me know. That would be so great if we could meet outdoors in the fresh air like that. But for now, if you can join us either at 9 or at 10.30 this coming Sunday morning, please take the time to sign up online. If you don't have internet access, if you need any help with the sign-up process, get in touch with either me or with Kenna or anybody else in the congregation who has an email um, address that's registered to their account on the church website, they can sign you up and put your name in that blank and do that on your behalf. So thank you so much uh, for your help with this. In terms of good news this week, I am thankful for... Uh, I guess what I'll call Corona Cut, probably number six or so, give or take, since the pandemic began. Some of you know my mom cut my hair for the first probably 19, 20 years of my life until I uh, started dating uh, Kaola and down at Freed Hardem, and she gave me a few haircuts down there in the in the dark room that was mine to use uh, for my time at Freed Hardeman. And so she cut my hair, oh, all the way up until she was about eight months into uh, expecting our daughter and at that point she, she said nope can't do it <laughs> no, no more haircuts uh, not doing that so I went to a, a barber for I think the first time in my life as far as I know um, probably around the age of 30 or so that was here in Madison over at the uh, Meadowood uh, the barber on Meadowood there off of Whitney Way on the southwest side of Madison so I did that for a number of years and then when the pandemic began, it got to be a couple months into it. And I'm thinking, there is no way I'm going back to the barber again. And so I, I looked at my wife, said, okay, I, I think it's about time. And uh, can you get back into this? And she said, sure. And so we've been going out in the garage for haircuts the last year or so. And uh, it's been fun, all, all kinds of weather and everything. And on that first cut, I said, okay, on one condition, um, if you can make me look like Gibbs, Leroy Jethro Gibbs from NCIS. I'm like, that's that's who I need to look like. And, and so we joke about that ever since then. And whenever I uh, need a haircut, I'll say, okay, uh, can you Gibbs me? Um, can you Gibbs me? And uh, that's what we've, we've been saying. Um, my grandfather had a thing. He would say, you know what the difference is between a good haircut and a bad haircut? And then he would say, about two days. <laughs> and after two days, it kind of doesn't matter anymore. So we're only one day into this one, but uh, anyway, I'm thankful for another uh, Corona cut and uh, that she was willing to Gibbs me last night, so I'm thankful for that. Anyway, tonight we return to our study of the book of Acts, a history of the early church written by, the apostle, uh, by Luke to a man by the name of Theophilus. And Luke, of course, is referred to in the New Testament by Paul as the beloved physician, and so it's written by Luke to Theophilus. Um... And up to this point in the book, we've we've looked at the first four chapters, and we're into chapter five now, about to begin chapter five, or finish chapter five. In the ABCs of Acts, we summarize chapter one with the word ascension, referring to the ascension of Jesus back into heaven. In chapter two, we looked at the beginning of the church. Peter preaches, and 3,000 people are baptized and added by God to the church, so we have the beginning of the church. In chapter three, we saw a man carried by his friends. And left at the temple gates, he's healed by Peter and John, and so the summary is carried and cured. And that's been an update to the ABCs. That's a good improvement over what we had before, carried and cured. In chapter 4, Peter and John are arrested. They are thrown into prison. They are threatened by the council to stop preaching about Jesus. But they are determined disciples, and so they don't give up, but they stubbornly continue preaching as they are supposed to do. And then last week, we looked at the first half of Acts chapter 5, with the incident where Ananias and Sapphira lie about the, I guess we'd say the percentage of their contribution it wasn't really the amount that was the problem. It was how much of the sale of their land that they gave. And they're struck dead by God right there on the spot for lying about that. And we might expect this to hurt the growth of the early church, but the opposite happens. Great fear spreads among the people. Big multitudes are added to their number. Well, last week we gave the preview of empty jail, summarizing Acts chapter 5, and we didn't get to the empty jail last week, but tonight we continue with the rest of Acts chapter 5, and we finally get to see the empty jail. And our first paragraph tonight starts in Acts 5.17. 
it continues through the first part of verse 21. So uh, people are turning to the Lord left and right. Things are going very well. And now we come to Acts 5, verse 17, down through the first half of verse number 21. So Acts 5, 17. But the high priest rose up along with his associates, that is, the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. They laid hands on the apostles and put them in a public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the gates of the prison, and taking them out, he said, Go, stand and speak to the people in the temple the whole message of this life. Upon hearing this, they entered into the temple about daybreak and began to teach. Well, let's remember this passage comes right after the last paragraph where Luke describes many signs and wonders taking place at the hands of the apostles and the people holding the apostles in high esteem. They were greatly respected. They were listening. Multitudes were being added to their number, people being healed uh, just by passing through Peter's shadow. So they were waiting in the streets, just hoping that his shadow might fall upon them. And everybody's being healed and, and things are going so well. So we come to verse 17 and the high priest and his people, the Sadducees, are very jealous of this. And they're, they're boiling over, they're enraged, they're really jealous about what's going on here. So Peter's doing these things that they cannot even imagine doing. And so they arrest the apostles yet again. It's almost very similar to what happens in the previous chapter. This seems to be the second time, at least here in Luke's account. Only here we don't seem to be exactly told who is arrested or put in jail for the night other than the apostles. Before it was Peter and John, now it's just the apostles, and we'll have a reference to Peter here in a bit. However, Luke tells us that during the night, an angel of the Lord opens up the gates of the prison, he takes them out, and then he tells them to go stand and speak to the people in the temple the whole message of this life. And with this, I've been reminded several times the past few days that there are some phrases in this chapter that I'm not very familiar with. And I know I've read this chapter a number of times in my lifetime, but it, it just sounds a little bit unusual to me. It's one of those things I've forgotten about. And I know I've read this, but uh, but this this strikes a new chord with me. It's, uh, it's an interesting phrase here, as the angel refers to the whole message of this life. It's just an interesting way of describing the Christian faith. We are teaching, we are preaching the life, either a reference to Jesus, Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life, but the Christian faith itself is a life or a lifestyle. It is a way of living. And not wasting any time upon hearing this, Luke says, they go straight to the temple and they begin to teach. And so they're thrown in jail for teaching and preaching. The angel releases them, and at daybreak the next morning, they're right back out there at it again. Just a note on angels here. In Hebrews, angels are described as ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. And that's exactly what we see here. This angel is not the star of the story. The angel is not the superhero. The, the angel is not the, the point of this. But the angel is a servant, a ministering servant sent out. And he's doing something that makes the preaching of the gospel possible. So the angel himself is not preaching, but he makes the preaching of the gospel possible. Well, let's read on to see what happens next. So we continue with the last half of Acts 5.21, and then we continue down through verse 26. So Acts 5.21b, the second half of the verse, as it says on the screen there, and let's go down through verse 26. Now when the high priest and his associates came, they called the council together, even all the senate of the sons of Israel, and sent orders to the prison house for them to be brought. But the officers who came did not find them in the prison, and they returned and reported back, saying, We found the prison house locked quite securely, and the guards standing at the doors. But when we had opened up, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple guard and the chief priest heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them as to what would come of this. But someone came and reported to them, The men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went along with the officers and proceeded to bring them back without violence, for they were afraid of the people that they might be stoned. The next morning then, the council comes together. They call for the apostles to be brought out of jail. But the officers come back with the report that the jail is locked securely with the guards standing at the doors, but nobody is inside. By the way, I just quickly looked up the word translated here as Senate in verse 21. I just don't remember 
that word being used to refer to the Sanhedrin. This is another one of those things in chapter 5 that I just don't remember really well. And I don't remember them being called the Senate. And so I clicked on that and looked at the Greek word behind it. And the root of this word is a word that we might actually recognize in English. It is the basis for English words like gerontology or geriatrics. And so the word that uh, Luke uses here in verse 21 literally refers to a council of old guys. A council of old guys. Anyway, the old guys, most likely the members of the Sanhedrin, they call for the apostles to be brought, but they're not there. The jail's empty. And so we have empty jail. And that's the summary for chapter 5 in the ABCs of Acts. Empty jail. In verse 24, they all talk about this, and they can't explain it. They are perplexed. They really have no explanation. And I'm thinking there's, at least in the back of their minds, there's the possibility that there's somebody on the inside. One of their own people has let them out of the jail, the chief jailer, the warden, or whatever. Beyond that, they really don't have a good explanation, and, and their uh, speculating is, is not recorded for us here. Um, but of course, many things have happened over the past few weeks that do not happen. People getting out of jail, that shouldn't happen. Uh, just mysteriously in the middle of the night. But again, many things like this have happened over the past several months. And it, and it gets even more concerning for the chief priest when someone comes in as they're trying to figure this out and lets them know that the guys they put in prison are now out there standing in the temple teaching the people. Well, in response, they bring them back in. And I would note here that they make a point of doing it peacefully. They do it without violence because the priests are afraid of the people. They're so scared, in fact, of the people that they're worried that the people might stone them. Not stone Peter and the apostles, but the chief priest and the members of the Sanhedrin are worried that the people might stone them, the members of the Sanhedrin. And so the members of this council, they're the ones who are unpopular here. And that's a dangerous place to be serving as leaders. They're not really leading the people. They are scared of the people. And obviously that's because they're on the wrong side of everything that's going on here. Uh, what I find interesting with all of this is that Luke is explaining this to Theophilus. Remember, one of the reasons for the book of Acts was to show that Christianity is a peaceful religion. It is not a threat to the authorities, and this demonstrates that. This is yet another example of that. Uh, the apostles, Peter and the other apostles, they could have very easily not come with these guards who came to bring them before the Senate. They could have said, no, make me or something like that, and it kind of got really ugly at that point, but they don't do that, so they come peacefully, and so Luke, I believe, is using this as an opportunity to demonstrate the peaceful nature of the Christian faith to Theophilus, who is perhaps a government official. So the leaders are clearly scared. The early church could have very easily staged a political revolution here to overthrow the Jewish leadership, but they do not. This is not the purpose of the Christian faith. And again, Luke makes sure to mention this to Theophilus, who, as we learned a few weeks ago, might have actually been a government official. Uh, he is addressed as most excellent Theophilus, very similar to the way Paul will go on to address Felix and Festus, uh, both Roman governors. And so I would just point that out with, with relation to these verses here, that uh, that could be the reason behind it, kind of putting uh, Theophilus' mind at ease as a government official himself, that the Christian faith is not a threat to him personally. All right, let's go on and see what happens next. The apostles have been threatened and jailed. Now they've escaped. Now they go right back uh, to preaching in the temple. And so let's continue with Acts 5, 27 through 32. When they had brought them, they stood them before the council. The high priest questioned them, saying, We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior, to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. So when they're brought before the council, notice the high priest seems to be extremely concerned that by continuing to preach about Jesus, they might bring this man's blood upon us. Well, why is that little phrase familiar to us, bringing his blood upon us? Well, back in Matthew 27, 24 and 25, when these same people had brought Jesus to Pilate, 
Remember, there was a point in that trial when Pilate could see that a, that a riot was starting and Pilate took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves. And you remember all the people said, his blood be upon us and on our children. So in the heat of that moment, as they are in this rush to murder the Lord, they had asked for his blood to be upon them and upon their children. And here they are just a short time later. They don't want his blood upon them now. They don't want to be guilty of having murdered Jesus at this point. Well, Peter then responds, we must obey God rather than men. Back when I was in high school, I remember going door to door and putting flyers on doors with a friend of mine from the church down there. His name was Steve. And um, and some time into it, we, we've been doing this on, I think, maybe a Saturday morning. We've been going door to door, not knocking, just putting flyers on doors. And a police officer actually pulled up to us and uh, basically kind of yelled out the window and said, hey, you can't be going door to door like that unless you have a permit in the city of Crystal Lake. Well, I think... Um, all these police interactions from my high school years are, are coming back to me this week after the one I told you about on Sunday. Um, I don't remember much about any further interaction with that officer, but uh, I remember that after he left, we went back to doing what we were doing. We were so so rebellious, hanging church flyers on, on doors or whatever. But I remember we, we talked about it briefly. Well, what are we going to do? And, and we remembered that verse. We must obey God rather than men. And looking back on it, of course, I would do that differently. And we have done it differently through the years. Since then, every time before we go door to door, um, and it's been a few years since we've done this, but every time I do, uh, before we go door to door, I always call the police first, like the day before or earlier that morning, and I let them know what we are doing. And so I'll give them a heads up. And several times people have been upset and they'll get a flyer on their door and they'll say, how dare you do this? Get this stuff off my door. This is against the law. We've had people say that. There's a anti-leafleting ordinance in Madison. Come get this trash off my door. There's no such thing. And, and several times when people get upset at us, then they'll say, we're going to call the cops on you. And I've been able to say, uh, we've already called them this morning. They know that we're doing what we're doing here. And the Madison police know that we're out here today. And we talked to some officers many years ago, and that's what they suggested. And that way, if they get a call about us being out in a the neighborhood, they already know. And so they don't need to send somebody to check us out because they know who we are. And I just say this to illustrate that it's often possible to obey both God and man simultaneously if we do it right. With a little bit of effort, with a little bit of creativity, there are many situations where we can satisfy the laws of the land in good conscience while still also doing what God wants us to do. And we've seen this in the pandemic, haven't we? On one hand, as a church, um, some have, and, and we could have said, God wants us to worship. We don't care what the government has to say about it. We're going to do what we've always done. We're not making any changes. And I understand the thinking of those who have gone that route. We, though, however, have done everything possible to continue worshiping as we should while also taking the science into account and obeying the government at the same time. And, you know, I might have some strong opinions about my freedom and some of the motives behind much of what we've seen this past year. And yet I think a lot of us also realize that as a congregation, there is a value um, to to giving the cops a call before we go door to door, tying this into the previous example. There's a value in uh, operating under the government that God has given us at the time in the best way that we know how. So Peter, though, he doesn't really have that option here, does he? This is not some way that he can, it's not really compromising, but there's really no way to work with this. There's no way to do what he needs to do and still satisfy the demands of his local authorities. The authorities here are outright ordering him not to teach. Thou shalt not teach the gospel kind of thing. And of course, his conclusion is we must obey God rather than men. Now, as we apply this to our own lives tonight, maybe I should add, ask this. If the police came to your door tonight, ordering you personally to stop teaching people about Jesus, what would change in your life tomorrow? Or to put it another way, if you personally were brought up on charges of teaching people about Jesus, 
Would the district attorney be able to find enough evidence to convict you of having done that over the past week? Or would that case be dismissed for a lack of evidence? In other words, as we have these theoretical discussions about persecution, we need to be asking ourselves whether we're really doing anything worthy of being persecuted for. Am I personally teaching somebody about Jesus? Or am I doing what Peter was doing here? And I hope that line of reasoning makes sense. As we ask the so what question, what does this really mean for us? They've commanded Peter to stop teaching and preaching about Jesus. And so the question for us is, is that a valid command for us? Are we teaching people about Jesus? Could somebody say this about us? Or would the authorities um, not have to bother with that because we aren't doing it anyway, if this were the case? So just something to think about there. As Peter responds, I notice in verse 30 how Peter refers to the God of our fathers. And so I think he's pointing out there, we worship the same God. And our God raised up Jesus, the one whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. Peter then describes how God exalted Jesus to his right hand as a prince and a savior for the purpose of allowing Israel to repent and be forgiven. Notice again, Peter doesn't go full-blown hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and live a faithful life until you die. He doesn't give all the steps in the plan, but he's meeting these men where they are. What they need to do right now is repent. They need to recognize that what they've done is sin, and they need to turn away from it. They need to turn back to God. And Peter closes by reminding them that he and the others and God's Holy Spirit are witnesses of these things. They've been eyewitnesses. So we now come to how these men react. And let's continue then with Acts 5, 33 through 39. Acts 5, 33 through 39. But when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and intended to kill them. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up in the council and gave orders to put the men outside for a short time. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you propose to do with these men. For some time ago, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men joined up with him. But he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him. He too perished, and all those who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I say to you, stay away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or action is of men, it will be overthrown. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them, or else you may even be found fighting against God. Well, up at the beginning, we find here that these men, members of the Sanhedrin, they react to Peter's words by being cut to the quick. We might say they were pierced to the heart. That's the thought here, just as we saw back in chapter 2 with the crowd on Pentecost. Only instead of actually repenting, and using this pain as a motivation to change their lives, change their behavior, they take this pain and they turn it back on Peter, don't they? They want to kill him just like they killed Jesus. At this point, though, Gamaliel stands up and he has Peter and the others removed from the room. So we're going to discuss this privately. And he has some advice to his fellow members of the Sanhedrin in private. And depending on how we look at it, the advice is either very wise or it is cowardly. Whatever the case, it is a practical answer, isn't it? Very pragmatic, but it's the answer given by a politician. The courageous thing to do here would be to say, we really messed up by having Jesus crucified. Peter's telling the truth. He can prove it from scripture, and we need to repent. We need to turn back to God. We, we did a bad thing here. That would be the courageous answer. But what Gamaliel says, though, is that we basically need to wait. Let's just not do anything rash, and there's a good chance that this whole thing with Jesus will blow over, as it did with these other two men. And he gives a couple examples of religious revolutionaries who have come and gone. Thutis with his 400 followers, Judas of Galilee and his people. Both of these men arose. They looked promising for a time. They had some followers, but they died, and their movements came to an end. And so Gamaliel's advice is, in the same way, let's just wait and see on this one. Leave these men alone. If there's some kind of man-made movement like these other two, this problem will go away. It'll just take care of itself. But if Peter and the others are actually from God, 
then there's nothing we could ever possibly do to stop it. And we would actually find ourselves fighting against God. And again, practically speaking, it gets them out of the current crisis, doesn't it? Because remember, they're scared of the people. They can't really do too much here. But Gamaliel, I think, really is being a coward here. At least that's the way that I look at it. And why is Gamaliel familiar to us? If you remember, um, Saul, whose name was later changed to Paul, uh, studied under a man by the name of Gamaliel. And I'm, we're assuming it is the same guy here. And there's a chance that Saul is in on this discussion, at least as a student of Gamaliel. The timing is very close, so we're not told, but it's possible that Saul, uh, if he wasn't here, he definitely knew about it. This is something that Gamaliel would have talked about as he trained um, the people under him. All right, let's look at what happens next by concluding tonight with Acts 5, verses 40 through 42. Acts 5, 40 through 42. They took his advice, and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then released them. So they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So the other old guys on the council then, they listen to Gamaliel's advice. They do, though, have the apostles flogged. They are severely beaten. That's about all they can get away with doing at this point. And they order them again to stop speaking in the name of Jesus, and then they let them go. And I can't help but assume that the men on the council know that Peter and the others won't listen right? Peter has straight up said that they won't listen to the command not to preach and teach. He's already said that, and so they know what they're going to do from this. But uh, this is what happens. They are released, and they go on their way rejoicing that they've had the privilege of suffering for the name of Jesus, and they keep on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ, uh, both in the temple and from house to house. Next week, let's pick up with Acts 6, if the Lord wills. So tonight was empty jail, Acts chapter 5, the letter E, empty jail. So we're looking for something starting with the letter F next week to summarize what happens in Acts chapter 6. So if you have something starting with the letter F that summarizes what happens in chapter 6, I would love to hear from you, and I'd love to share that with the class next week. And remember, if you haven't done it already, even if you have, uh, try to either read through or listen to the entire book of Acts all at once, if at all possible. It takes about two, two and a half hours. And that'll certainly help us understand what's going on in the whole book. Uh, thank you for taking the time to study together tonight. I hope to see you for worship this coming Sunday, either at 9 or 1030. Again, this would be a great time to sign up if you haven't. Uh, let me know if I can help. Let me know if you have something that we need to be praying about. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the God who has all authority in heaven and on earth. And so today, when we face the choice of obeying you or anyone else, we pray that we would always have the courage to choose you above all others. You are the great God and King and the only one truly worthy of our trust and complete obedience. Tonight we pray for our government officials. We pray that you would bless them with wisdom. We pray that we might be able to live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and with dignity. And when government authorities pressure us to compromise our faith, we pray that we would react with the courage of Peter and the others here in Acts chapter 5. We're thankful, Father, that you have given us ways to provide for our families. We're thankful for work, and we're thankful for answered prayers, as several of our members have now found new jobs lately. We pray that we might continue to labor with our hands so that we would always have the ability not only to provide for ourselves and our families, but especially so we would have the ability to share with others, as you have instructed. We pray for opportunities to do good in your name. Tonight, we ask for peace in this world, and we pray that we as your people might have opportunities to bring peace and calm into our own little pieces of this world, into our workplaces, into our schools, and into our families. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.